A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, none of us lives for oneself, and no one dies for oneself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why then do you judge your brother or sister? Or you, why do you look down on your brother or sister? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bend before me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Verum Domini. I believe that I shall see the good things of the Lord in the land of the living. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, this I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may gaze on the loveliness of the Lord and contemplate his temple. I believe that I shall see the bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord with courage. Be stout-hearted and wait for the Lord. Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus addressed this parable to them. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman having 10 coins and losing one would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be more rejoicing among the angels of God 
over one sinner who repents. Verbum Domini. Today's two readings deal with two different kinds of problems that existed in the early Christian movement. And one is at the life of Christ in Palestine. The other is in the life of the early church in Rome and in the diaspora in general, where there were Jews scattered throughout the ancient world. And Paul had to write to certain issues that came up because Jews and Gentiles both were being converted and there were tensions. In the gospel, our Lord is confronted by a criticism that the Pharisees and scribes, the scribes were the intellectuals among the Pharisees. And they come and complain that he not only welcomes sinners, but eats with them. There were two problems in the mindset of the Pharisees. One problem is that they believed that the Messiah would come if every Jew obeyed the law of God for just one half hour. Some thought maybe an hour. But if every Jew would obey the law for that short period of time, that would be the window of opportunity for the coming of the Messiah. And every sinner in their mindset was stopping the coming of the Messiah who would redeem Israel from the Romans and from other oppressors. And so, that was one problem. The second problem is that our Lord was having table fellowship with these sinners. Now among the Pharisees, as we see in this Gospel of Luke, in the chapters before this, coming to have table fellowship with the Pharisees was a very important part of the social process. This is where you not only had food, but exchange of ideas among the various Pharisees would go on and discussions about the meaning of the law would happen. And the Pharisees were very, very concerned to keep the Jewish kosher laws regarding foods and ritual cleanliness and to have known sinners come to the table would bring an uncleanliness to the meal. And here Christ is welcoming these sinners. Now these two problems set a division between Christ and the Pharisee party, which was mostly a party of lay leadership. It was laity who were trying to purify the Jewish religion by strict adherence to the law. And he tells these, well, there are three parables. Today we hear two of them. The parables are about sinners that return. One is of the, they, they, he describes them as being lost. This is a very Old Testament understanding of sin. In the Old Testament, they, there are a variety of words for sin. And one of them is to wander like sheep. And that's one of the things that's used here, that the sheep has, uh, is lost. In Matthew's version, it says wander. And the sense of wandering away from the flock is a standard term for sin. There are a couple words for that, ta'a, ah, and a couple others. And this is a sense of bringing the sinner back, 
causes great rejoicing in heaven. Now, again, keep in mind, heaven is where the greatest banquet of all is to be celebrated. So that the table fellowship here on earth was simply meant to be a preparation for and a symbol of the great banquet of heaven. Christ uses that theme a number of times when he describes the kingdom of heaven as being like a wedding feast in another place where there's this great rejoicing in heaven as at a wedding feast. And the book of Revelation describes the same thing. So this sense of rejoicing in heaven means that the great banquet that takes place in heaven welcomes these sinners. And if heaven is willing to welcome these sinners with God and his angels rejoicing, then how much more should we invite the returning sinners to table fellowship? And this is going to be a, a call to all of us. It's not only something that applies to Jesus and the Pharisees. We all have to keep in mind that there are a wide variety of sinners out there. And we want them to return. Like the woman's coin, you know, that's lost. As a matter of fact, it's not only that we want them to return, we need to be like the shepherd and the woman in today's parables. She lit a lamp and got her broom. Houses in those days oftentimes did not have windows. They would have a doorway, so they'd be kind of dark. So to light a lamp is to catch the glint because the coin was a silver drachma. So it might catch the glint of the silver. And the broom might sweep it and make it clink against the stone inside the house, because oftentimes they had dirt floors, or hit something in the house, a piece of furniture or something, and make a noise so that she can hear it. So she's taking two kinds of steps that's oriented to specifically finding a coin, to hear it clink and to see it shine. And she seeks out that coin which she misses more now that it's lost than she did when she had it. And this sense is part of what we ought to be doing ourselves, searching for the sinners, searching for them and using the tools that are specific. Now, to know the specific tools to find the sinners means that we must understand something of why they are lost from the community of faith. Why are they no longer with us? Or why were they never with us in the first place? There are a wide variety of reasons. And we need oftentimes to specify how we are going to seek out those sinners. You know, there are some people who are hooked on various drugs and it's not enough just to tell them you shouldn't be hooked on drugs, but to find out why were you on drugs in the first place? And to help them to deal with freedom from their addiction is the next step. And it's not the same as helping people with other problems, people who are addicted to pornography and Ill illicit uses of sexuality also have to be addressed with their concerns. People who are materialistic and focused on money have to be dealt with by their concerns. And that means at times we need to listen to the sinners, not just argue with them. Listen, what is it that keeps them away from the flock? What is it that keeps them lost? And then use what we can to, to the best of our ability to coax them back. Now, there's also another thing we have to keep in mind. 
that we cannot so get into the world that we get trapped by it. You know, we don't want to say, well, I'll try to understand the drug user by trying drugs. That would be a mistake. That would be a mistake. I'll understand the pornographer by using pornography. That would be a very serious sin. You know, so we don't want to go to that extent of trying to find out. We don't need to take the poison to know that it's poison. But we need to understand from them why they are the way they are and to help bring them back. This is going to be our task. And to rejoice that they return to faith in God, to good morals, to righteousness on all sorts of levels. These are going to be part of our tasks. Whereas St. Paul is dealing with a different situation. The Jewish community who lived in the diaspora, that is, they lived in the Greek and Roman cities, and they formed communities among themselves within those cities because they had to keep the kosher laws regarding food. They also had Saturdays off. The pagans didn't take a day off. They didn't have a holy day. And so the Jews were distinct, plus they had various feast days. And in the first six verses of chapter 14, from which our reading is taken today, St. Paul is describing how some people are dividing themselves up within the community over dietary issues. Some are not eating any meat and eating only vegetables to make sure they're not polluted by unclean meat. And they didn't worry so much about vegetables and grains. While others were celebrating the freedom of Christianity and not worrying about it because they didn't care about those things. Both of these tensions existed and there was a danger that some of the Jewish Christians would be so scandalized by the Gentile Christians who were not keeping kosher laws that they might say, we have to go back to our Judaism. Christianity leads to watering down. Or the other danger was to try and force the Gentiles to follow Jewish dietary laws and their feast days. And St. Paul was saying, look, either one of these is fine. You have to keep, stop judging each other over those issues. And that's his point in today's text. That's why it says none of us lives for himself and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And that this is going to be the basic principle by which we discern how we uh, act in regards to feast days, holy days and other things of, of the Jewish calendar versus not keeping them as Gentiles. That's, that's what we do it. And that the basic issue is, this is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. That Christ's death and resurrection is the norm by which we judge the behavior of keeping the Jewish holy days or not, keeping the Jewish kosher laws or not. And if it does not affect the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we don't make it into the be all and end all. His death and resurrection is the turning point and not these other issues between Jewish practices and Gentile practices. And that's why he then says, why then do you judge your brother and sister? And the issue is, you don't have a reason to judge them on this basis. To judge them as a bad Christian because they don't keep the Jewish holy days, or to judge them as a good Christian because they do keep the kosher laws, is not for us to do. 
For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. He will be the one to judge our hearts. And that that judgment is going to be true. And when we die, each one of us must stand before that judgment seat and let him judge us. That's going to be the task. If we start to judge the other person as being an authentic or inauthentic Christian because they keep kosher or not, then we are putting ourselves in the place of God. And that's what St. Paul is warning against. And that's why he gives this quote from Isaiah chapter 45. Every knee shall bend before me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. This is going to be the task, that we give an account to God of what we've done, why we've done it. And this is going to be the, the case for each of us. So we prepare ourselves. As a matter of fact, we recognize that on one hand, it's not just that there are big sinners out there who are lost sheep and lost coins. A lot of us can recognize ourselves in that and that the Lord has drawn us into fellowship with him and that we are going to make uh, the primary issues, the issues that are the authentic issues of the faith and that we are, going to, we are not going to get onto periphery issues that don't change our faith in the basis of Christianity. And that we are not going to be the ones. Jesus, our Lord, said the same thing, that don't judge lest you be judged by the same standard. We don't judge other people. We don't know the state of their soul. We don't know their conscience. It's difficult enough to know our own conscience and what's in that. And that that's why God is going to be the judge. He'll be a better judge than we are of ourselves, yet alone of other people. And our task is not to judge them. We can criticize sinful behavior. That is our task, to say that sinful behavior is sinful. We must do that. But we don't say, I know you're going to hell. I don't know that. That's none of my P's and Q's. That's up to God, our Lord. But for us to be able to, to put our trust in God's judgment is a point that Paul makes here and that we need to make the same point. 